So how did I get involved and in, in, interested in the summer of 1927 was I, I had... I'd known for a long time that, and I'd always found it slightly fascinating, that Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic and Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs, these two really important, iconic events in, in American popular culture, that they both happened at the same time, in the same summer, the summer of 1927. And I, and I just wondered, I'd been wondering for a long time, if it might somehow be possible to do a, a joint biography of these two guys, but with the, the, the sort of narrative arc of the book, coming towards the summer of 1927, that that's where the, the, these two stories would intersect somehow. And, I, and this was just a vague idea, and I didn't really know quite how it would work, but I'd, I was fascinated by both those guys and, this, and the fact that they were doing it at the same time. So then I just started looking into well, what else was going on in the summer of 1927. And what I found, to my genuine astonishment, was that they were only just a small part of what happened that summer. I mean, there was all kinds of other things happening. I mean, I think you can make a really good case, I hope I have in the book, that this was the most exciting and eventful summer in modern American history because you had, you know, they, they started the carving of Mount Rushmore. You had um, Sacco and Vanzetti, these two infamous anarchists, were executed that summer. And the whole world erupted in riots. I mean, Americans were absolutely hated because of ex executing these two anarchists. You had the Great Mississippi Flood, which was the biggest natural disaster in, in modern American history. It affected more lives than any other, any other catastrophic event ever. You had the f filming of The Jazz Singer, the first talking picture, which obviously transformed popular entertainment completely, and so on. And it just goes on and on like that. I mean, everywhere you look, if you look at Al Capone, it was the summer of his downfall. Um, so all of this stuff that was happening, it, it was just kind of one thing after another. And I realized this, the story here isn't just Babe Ruth and Charles Lindbergh. It's, it's actually all of this stuff happening, which is why I call the book One Summer, because it's all about this one amazing summer. Uh, Babe Ruth is an extraordinary guy, and, and he was a real worry to me because, of course, he's a baseball player, and baseball is something that a lot of people outside the United States are not going to be familiar with or necessarily receptive to. And the argument I had with my publisher here to persuade them that this is actually you know, a subject that's, that's worth doing is that I think it's, it's Babe Ruth, is, it's a human interest story. He was, he was an incredibly remarkable human being. I mean, he had a really, really tough childhood. He, he grew up in an orphanage. He was essentially just abandoned by his family. And, that, you know, he grew up to be one of the most famous and beloved and deservedly beloved sporting heroes that America has ever produced. And he was absolutely brilliant. Uh, and to see him, you know, to see photographs of him or to see, you know, film footage of him, he looks the least athletic person you've ever seen. But what he did was he just had the most magnificent combination of timing and strength and he hit home runs as nobody, literally nobody had ever done anything like it before. He was, in, as an individual, was hitting more home runs than most teams were hitting in the 1920s. And 1927 was his greatest year as a batter. So it's, a, you know, it's a really exciting story, I think. Um, you don't have to love baseball to understand that part of it. You just have to understand a home run is when you hit a ball a long ways. It goes over the fence and it's, you know, it's a moment of jubilation for the person who hits it and for the fans. And that's all you have to understand. And the rest of it is just human interest story. And he was, you know, I, he was the, probably of all the people I was dealing with, he was the one I came to like as a human being the most. Two things. I had two, two sort of breakthroughs in human knowledge with this book I was very proud of. One was that I discovered that an earlier use of the word co-pilot than had, was in the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, because I, I just looked in the Oxford English Dictionary to see when was the word co-pilot first used. And, and they said it was first used in, I think they said August or September 1927. And because I thought, well, should I use that when in, in the context of, of, of people, you know, two people in a cockpit? Is one of them a co-pilot? And, and then I, I looked in the New York Times from like May 10th or 12th or something had used co-pilot. So I was able to, to write to the Oxford English Dictionary and say, I found an earlier use. So I was, really, I was really pleased about that. I mean, so they will change, the Oxford English Dictionary will change very slightly because of, of something I found. And the other thing I found, which wasn't in any, in any of the books, and this really is very trivial, but it was a big moment for me. There's a character in the book named George Stump who plays a small part. He disturbs Lindbergh on the night before Lindbergh goes on his flight and, and, and keeps him from getting a good night's sleep. Well, well, something that's not in any of the other books, um, 
you know, Lindbergh's biographies or anything, uh, and I just, in fact, I just happened to stumble on, was that just a couple of months later, Stumpf himself was killed in an air crash. So, um, so I mean, I'm, I was able to put that in the book because, and that was again just serendipitous, you know, messing around in libraries and looking at things. And I, I, um, I was just reading back issues of the New York Times, and I saw an article about that, because he has such a distinctive name. There was a little headline that said, you know, something George Stump dies in, you know, air crash in Missouri. So I recognized it, knew it because of that. But it was only because I was lucky enough to be reading the right page at the right time. Oh, when you re when you read your book, it is it is a really strange experience because it is completely different. I mean, you, you know, I know the book inside and out. I've I've written obviously every word of it, and I've thought very hard about how those words are going to be laid out, and I know all the you know the stories behind them and everything. And yet, when you read it, it takes on a kind of completely separate life. It has entirely new rhythms. It has, you know, there are sentences that that I think can work quite well on the page and then suddenly become quite difficult to say aloud, I mean, because they're, they're long or they've got, you know, sort of parenthetical thoughts that don't work so well. And so you have to kind of modify and adjust them slightly to make, make them work audibly as, as, as well as um, visually on the page. So it's a really interesting experience. And it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm reading the proofs for the American publisher right at the same time. Separately right now, I have a separate set of proofs, that, page proofs that I'm reading for the publisher. And this is the most immensely helpful, reading the book aloud. And I'm constantly finding things. I think, oh, no, I can change. I can make that better. I can, you know, now that I've actually enunciated it, I can see a way to improve that sentence. And so what I'm doing is, is making a small adjustment in the recording and then going and making a, a similar adjustment on the page. Do I listen to audiobooks? Yes, I do. Um, I do. I, I, my life is that I, I, I work all morning, a typic, typical day when I'm at home. I, I, I start very early. I'm usually at my desk by about 6, and I usually work until about about midday till about 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock. And, and then the rest of the day I spend in the garden. We have a big garden, four acres, and, and we're out there and we work on it pretty intensively, my wife and I. And I find just being in the garden kind of dull. So I, um, th to me, one of the great things was, you know, MP3 players and being able to put the two little things in your ears and listen. So I listen to books, and I, I have quite devotedly listened to books for a long time, or podcasts. And I don't listen to music much, but I'll listen to it, almost anything spoken word. And I really love it, and I really enjoy it. Because, you know, for me, w one of the great pleasures of it is that it gives you a chance to experience books that that I want to read, but I'm never going to get around to read. I mean, I'm, I'm particularly big on like sort of listening to or 19th century novels and things like that, you know, Trollope or Dickens and things like that that I've been meaning for years to read and, and in a sense, you know, I'm getting it, somebody's doing it for me. While I'm doing, you know, healthful manual labor at the same time, I find that's just an absolutely perfect combination.